everyone had a happy Thanksgiving. Am I echoing? Now that Thanksgiving has passed, I give you all permission to decorate for Christmas, listen to Christmas music, uh, set up lights, do all of the things, watch all of the movies, but you know, we had to wait until Thanksgiving was passed first and give that turkey his due. Um, but I do love this time of year and I also want to extend my thanks to our artists that we have in our body and also all the manpower that came and made it happen. So thank you all so much. Uh, we wrapped up our devoted sermon series last week with a panel of testimonies. Wasn't that so cool and encouraging? And today we begin Advent. It's the four weeks that precede Christmas, and we'll be exploring in these four weeks the good news, the good news that Jesus has come, and we'll be doing it through the lens of those who witnessed it. Today, we're going to discuss the good news of hope as seen through a man named Isaiah, whose spirit bore witness to the coming of Jesus 700 years before his birth. It's like he's standing right there, looking at me. I'm here, things are normal, and then they're not. I'm not. I'm there somewhere. I can see him plain as day in my mind's eye talking to me. He looks right at me with those strange eyes that are like fire and water at the same time. The Messiah, the one who will come and make everything right the one we've been talking about forever. <sighs> the spirit of Adonai Yahweh is on me. That's what he told me. The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. I can still hear him saying it. It's like he's standing right here. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the favor of Yahweh. The year of the favor of Yahweh. When is that? Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That means God with us. God with us. God with us on earth. This will be the best news since that the world has ever heard. It was good news. It is good news. It's exceedingly, abundantly great news. God with us. Isaiah was a prophet and a preacher. The biblical prophets, which is that section in your Bible after Proverbs from Isaiah to Malachi, uh, they served as a wake-up call to God's people. They made it very uncomfortable to keep God on the fringe of life, 
They challenged cultural norms and called people to radical repentance and wholehearted devotion. They had zero margin for compromise and were never particularly sensitive to people's feelings. Today, we would criticize them for having a painfully low EQ. These guys were not popular. They weren't diplomatic. They sometimes acted out their prophecies in dramatic fashion, and other times they received these prophecies while in a trance. They were some strange birds. Nonetheless, they were the voice of hope. In the middle of exile and defeat and sin, they pointed the way forward to God's promised salvation through the coming Messiah. And there are hundreds, hundreds of these declarations of hope throughout the prophetic literature in the Old Testament. We call these messianic prophecies. And today we're going to look at a few of Isaiah's messianic prophecies to stir in us new hope. And pray. God, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the good news of your birth. Thank you for coming to restore relationship with God the Father to us. Thank you for being so, so good. Would you help us today to understand a little bit more how good you are and how very good this news of Christmas is? We love you and we commit our ears, our hearts, our minds, all of our being to you right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to start with one of Isaiah's prophecies in chapter 11. Verse 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jesse. Jesse has been dead about 500 years at this time. He was David's dad. And David was Jesus' great, 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 like times 20, grandfather. And it says that from Jesse, this dead man, a shoot springs forth. Life. Something green coming from something that's dead. Imagine with me. That this afternoon, and it's not the prettiest day out, but imagine that you decide to go on um, a Sunday drive. Does anybody still do that? It's like a thing, wasn't it, for a while? A Sunday drive, and you go up to the Blue Ridge Parkway, and you want to just admire the evergreens and the trees, the forest. It's beautiful even when the leaves are gone, right? Right? Even when the leaves have fallen, there is something beautiful and majestic and glorious about being in the forest. At least I think so. I love it. We just, did, we just hiked Humpback Rocks a couple weeks ago with my family, and it was actually a little bit gray like this, and it was still stunningly beautiful. But imagine that you get up to the Shenandoah National Park, and you look all around, and every tree cut down. Every tree laid waste. There's ash. It's just a pile of ruin and rubble. Trees have fallen. There's no life in the place. Well, this is actually the exact scene that Isaiah would have been preaching to. This is it. The Assyrians had come after them and they had laid waste this territory. So all around Isaiah, as he's preaching, are probably stumps and rubble, a lifeless 
cold mess. And we, we actually know this, that it, it's described in Isaiah chapter 10, right before it talks about the trees of Lebanon and everything being laid down. That's one of the, one of the reasons I think we hesitate in diving into uh, the prophetic literature is because it does expect from you a little bit of historical knowledge. It's not hard. Just go do the research and you'll find this like rich wealth hidden within these books. And so Isaiah is prophesying in the middle of a desolate wasteland, a shoot of life. Hope. One little green sprig of life shooting up from a dead stump, which means what? That there is life underground. That there is still a root that is healthy and alive and growing. And Isaiah says, from the stump of Jesse comes Jesus. From death will come life. Our hope, you see, is rooted. And it's rooted in a person. Our hope isn't dependent on all that we can see. I think there's probably some of you here today who feel like your life is that desolate wasteland. Everything's been cut down. Things have been burned to the ground, laid waste. But in the middle of that place, there is still hope. Because our hope isn't dependent on our circumstances. Our hope isn't dependent on what we can see. Our hope isn't reasonable. Our hope isn't dependent on diagnoses or bank accounts. Our hope isn't dependent in in time or outcomes. Our hope is rooted in a person whose name is Jesus. Our hope is this shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Unshakable, immovable. He is who we can tether ourselves to forever. In 1 Peter 1, it says that we have a living hope. Our hope breathes. Our hope is Jesus. I'm going to again read the passage that Kate read this morning and Judy just about preached my message from. I love it when God does that. It's good. We can't can't actually extend. We, We can't squeeze out everything there is in these passages, so I love it. Isaiah 9. Verses 6 and 7, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called, let's say it with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. C.S. Lewis writes about Isaiah 9, and he says this, In the Christian story, God descends to reascend. He comes down down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down further still, if embryologists are right, to recapitulate in the womb ancient and pre-human phases of life, down to the very roots and seabed of the nature he has created. He goes down to come up again, and bring the whole ruined world up with him. One has a picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower 
to get himself under some great complicated burden. He must stoop in order to lift. He must, also disip- he must almost disappear under the load before he incredibly straightens his back and marches off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. He stoops to lift us up. (laughs) Our hope is rooted in Jesus. And who is Jesus? Isaiah outlines it for us. He gives us these characteristics. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Asher, do you want to go to that slide with the names? I want to just talk. This is one of the most common Christmas passages. You've likely heard this before. Even if this is one of your first times in church, you've probably heard this passage before. But there is something really beautiful, really powerful, hidden in each of these names. And this is going to be our proof that he is our hope worth tethering ourselves to. He's wonderful counselor. Counselor here doesn't mean therapist, although God has been my therapist many a time. But counselor here means king. He's our king. He's the one who, in his wisdom, gives instruction and leads a people. So he's, he's our king. He's the one who guides us, the one who leads us. And he's wonderful. I use this word all the time. It's wonderful. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> it, it doesn't just mean sweet, good, lovely. Wonderful here actually means incomprehensible. It means full of wonder. It means better than we can imagine. It's actually used in the Song of Moses in Exodus, after the people have crossed the Red Sea. In the song, they call God wonderful. It means the miraculous. It means the supernatural. It means far beyond anything that you could actually imagine. He's that good. He's that good of a king. So God's counsel leads us into the miraculous. He guides us towards the supernatural. This is the kind of leader I want. How about you? (laughs) He leads me towards miracles. He leads me into miracles. Does anybody in here need a miracle today? Just two of you, really? (laughs) Okay. Do you need a miracle in your health? Do you need a miracle in your finances? Do you need a miracle when it comes to your children? Guys, parenting is hard. I only have two, and I, I don't get it. Because what one needs, the other doesn't, and then they change. And I can't figure it out. I need a wonderful counselor. I need a wonderful counselor to teach me how to parent my children in a way that they'll see God working through me. I need need a wonderful counselor. Our hope is rooted in Jesus. Our hope is rooted in this wonderful counselor. And I want to pause right now. I want to pray that we would have this revelation of God, of Jesus, as our wonderful counselor. So just by faith right now, would you take that thing 
that you need a miracle for and just hold it right, right in front of you. Just, you can do it in your mind's eye. You don't have to actually do it. God, we want to receive you today as our wonderful counselor. We want to receive the miracles that you want to pour out on us today. God, we don't want to just live a normal life, but we want to step into the supernatural possibilities of our wonderful counselor. God, would you, would you bring miracles to marriages in this room right now? Would you bring miracles of health and healing and wholeness and restoration into this room right now? Jesus, would you bring financial miracles into this place right now? Would you release them, wonderful counselor? Jesus, would you be a wonderful counselor to all of our kids? Would you show them that you're not just stuck in a book somewhere, but that you are living and active and that you are moving on their behalf. Thank you, God, for being our wonderful counselor. Thank you, God, that our hope is tied to you being a wonderful counselor. In Jesus' name, amen. Mighty God. Jesus is mighty God. He is God. He is God in the flesh. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He is able to do anything he wants to do. He is mighty. This translates as strong. It, it has a, a military slant to it, though. He's a warrior. Our God is a mighty warrior. It's sometimes translated as hero. I love that. Jesus is your hero. He's come to rescue you. He's come to save you. Better than Spider-Man or Superman or Thor. He's come to save you. He is a God who has come to fight your battles and he has conquered sin and death. He's victorious. He never loses. Put your bets on this guy. Put your hope in him. Root your hope in Jesus, the one who will never, ever lose. He's our mighty God. I'm going to pray again. <laughs> God, thank you for being strong and powerful and mighty. God, thank you that you have authority over all things. God, thank you that there is no sin that is stronger than you. So God, I pray for anyone here today who is struggling with sin, which is all of us, by the way, would you help us to know you as mighty God, victorious? Would you release that over us today? In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is eternal Father. Eternal Father. He's never absent. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the origin and the end. He is the holder of all of time. He came into time, but he exists outside of time. He has the ability to heal our past and hold our future all at the same time. 
and he's our father. Especially in the times that Isaiah would have been preaching this message, the father is the one who gave identity to the family. Think about all the genealogies that you see in scripture. Family lines were so very important to these people. And so to call someone father meant that that's where you got your inheritance from. That's where you got your worth and your identity and your value from. And that is still where we get it all from today. He's eternal father. Always there from the beginning to the end. He is eternal and he is giving himself freely to us. Father was also always the protector. He's your protector and the provider. He has really deep pockets. And he's so, so generous. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for being our eternal father. God, thank you that we can root our identity in you and it holds us fast. Thank you that you're not going anywhere. Thank you that you hold all of time and space in the palm of your hand. Thanks for being a good dad. In Jesus' name, amen. Prince of Peace. Of course, the word here is shalom. And... It does mean, you know, that scene where Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat and the storm comes and the disciples get all worried and they wake Jesus up and he, he, you know, is aroused and then he says, peace, be still. It is that kind of peace, but it's actually more than that. It goes beyond that it means shalom it is a spiritual harmony that is brought about by an individual's restoration with god it is him being the prince of peace is us having the ability to come back into right relationship with god despite all of our sin despite all of our shortcomings despite it all His title, Prince of Peace, is our road into his presence. This means that the peace that Jesus provided by his work on the cross is not just a ceasefire between ourselves and God, but it is a peace that changes us from enemies of God to children of God. He's the prince of peace. One of my favorite quotes from A.W. Tozer says, I think he says it more complicated than this, but what I've dumbed it down to say is, the, the most important thing about me is what I believe about God. The most important thing about me is what I believe about God. I got a text this morning from a friend, just encouragement, just said, you know you're loved by God. (laughs) And it like, it hit something. I know that. But you know, I was kind of in a hurry, trying to put last minute adjustments and, you know, getting things together. And But peace comes when I know that I'm loved by God. Peace comes when I know that I'm secure in him. Peace comes when I know that I'm his. And that there's nothing for me to do that could earn that place. But that instead I just receive it as a gift.
<laughs> I, um, <clears throat> I really like Eugene Peterson, and I was reading a story that he wrote about when he was a boy, and he had gone to church, and his crazy uncle was with him. I think it was Easter or something, and he never really came to church. But as the offering plate was being passed around, he said, you know, he put his nickel in the offering plate. And then after it passed by his uncle, his uncle leaned over and whispered to him, opened his palm, and there was a $20 bill there. And he said, what'd you get? <laughs> Turns out it was a joke. But Eugene Peterson said he didn't know it was a joke until much, much later in life, and he was totally offended by it and, you know, scared. His parents, or his mom was like a crazy Pentecostal lady. And, um, and uh, but, but here's the thing. It is about what we get. I can, do, I can put all the nickels I've got into that offering plate. But really, it is, we receive something when we come to Jesus. We receive. What'd you get? Eternal security. Peace. In the deepest parts of my being, peace that holds me, helps me to know that I'm secure and held by him. That's a lot more than 20 bucks worth. Jesus, I pray for those in this room specifically who are dealing with anxiety and depression. Would you help them to see you as Prince of Peace in a whole new way? Would you overwhelm them with your peace? The reality that we have an unshakable, unbreakable connection to you, God our Father. God, would you help us all to know today you as Prince of Peace. Amen. Lastly, in Isaiah 7, verse 14, Isaiah prophesies that the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Our prophet already shared that verse with us today. Emmanuel, God with us. All these descriptors that we've talked about already, they're not far out and distant. They're not something to obtain and to hold, but they are right here, present now with us. Jesus is God with us. Our hope can be rooted in the reality that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Ministry team, come on forward, please. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we would love to pray with you. <laughs> He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. And not just right now here in this moment, but tomorrow morning, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday evening. He's with you. He is God with us. And it gives us such great hope. God, thank you for being with us. 
Thank you for your unending love. Thank you for the demonstration of your grace towards us. And I pray that the God of hope will fill you all with joy and peace as you believe so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I invite you to come forward and receive prayer for any needs that you have whatsoever. And I also encourage you to go and be hope. Be filled with hope and be hope to each person that you know. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.